Dark City seeks to understand the uncanny and the unknown, the unseen eldritch forces that lurk in the shadows and direct our fates. This channel seeks an objective and empirical analysis of seemingly otherworldly phenomena. Codes, symbolism, and secret languages are embedded everywhere around us. Media, the black mirror through which most view the world, has cast a spell upon the populace. Media's true purpose is couched in the very terms chosen to describe its functioning. From the use of television programming to broadcasting, its terms convey the utilization of a dark magic. It is a form of hypnosis at best, or something much darker at worst. Once again, come gaze into the black mirror and observe how the insidious technologies of severance are but reflections of the same in Dark City. Who are you? The series Severance raises interesting questions about consciousness and identity. The premise of the show is intriguing because it parallels a suspicion I have had in regard to where my body might go or how it might be used when I sleep. I often feel unrested when I rise in the morning and sometimes experience muscle aches and pains, as well as small wounds or scratches I cannot recall sustaining while awake. I also awaken often having memories of dreams that seem to be more of actual events that happened rather than the more etheric, otherworldly substance of dreams. I often visit the same dreamscape, the very familiar environment with the very same atmospheres and feelings, and I wonder if this is indicative of a bleed-through or a reintegration, as it is referred to in the series. Severance's premise explores the philosophical underpinnings and the ethical ramifications of inserting a technological chip into the brain that is able to isolate a region for the designation of a separate identity that is sequestered from the primary memory reserves of the existing host identity. This alternate identity and its memories are compartmentalized and inaccessible to the host, and the entire historical and episodic memory reserves of the host are unavailable to the altar. The primary identity is aware of the altar's existence but has no access to its experiences or its duties when it is activated. The insertion of the chip creates a literal separate being, which in this case, exists eternally in one place, a work environment in which its entire existence is confined to a very restricted environment that is rigidly controlled. Since the host identity remains ignorant of the separate identity's experiences, and more importantly, indifferent to its possible suffering, the alternate identity has no way to escape. It exists for all intents and purposes in a form of purgatory or hell, and its confinement, its very fate, is completely under the control of the host. Imagine finishing your shift and exiting the building only to find that you have walked through a door back into the same building to begin another shift with no time away. The severed process is a corporation's dream. It creates a worker whose labor can be exploited indefinitely and who has no legal recourse for maltreatment. The worker cannot communicate with the outside world and no memory of what happens at the job can be transmitted to his Audi. He is in essence a perpetual slave to be used at the whim of the corporation. Second, the severed workers can never reveal anything about the work they perform at the corporation. They, in effect, pose no threat to the corporation's agenda. They cannot leak information to the authorities if the corporation engages in illegal or unethical behaviors, nor can they betray the corporation by smuggling secrets to rival corporations. When Heliar tries to escape through requesting a resignation from her Audi, the term you do as a reference to the host or primary identity that resides in the external world, she is greeted the next day by a video message from herself that expresses with no compassion or consideration that her altar will never be allowed to leave a decision which basically condemns this personality to exist in a hell-like existence at the whims of its host. This raised a concern for me, and I immediately wondered if somehow a similar relationship existed between my higher self and this current hell-like world in which I am forced to live. I have often wondered what would happen if I attempted to take my own life, suspecting that the attempt would somehow always fail and I would awaken to discover that I had only made the situation worse for myself, such as now being forced to endure the same hardships and struggles, but with a diminished physical or intellectual ability. This is what Heliar's Audi quite literally threatens her altar with if she tries to maim her body to coerce an extraction. I am a person. 
You are not. I make the decisions. You do not. And if you ever do anything to my fingers, know that I will keep you alive long enough to horribly regret that. One of the altars begins to reintegrate, meaning he begins to have access to his Audi's experiences. They bleed into his altar's mind, causing him to seek escape. This led me to consider that perhaps this is what happens to some of us in this world, whatever its nature may be. A simulation, a matrix, or an actual constructed exhibit that one sees in a zoo. Perhaps the creators or engineers must find new forms of control. This is what I refer to as the morphing labyrinth, an ever-changing maze of control that adapts and responds to the consciousness of its captors. The labyrinth erects new walls or shifts corridors to lead the prisoner back deeper into the maze as a means to prevent escape or glimpses of the truth. If this scenario is true, it raises questions as to whether this world is a test that grants escape and reward to those who transcend its deception or if it's an intentional prison or farm designed to entrap our souls for harvest or some other mysterious usefulness? Or are we simply rats in an ongoing longitudinal experiment designed to measure our intellectual or spiritual capacities? How would we ever know if we were alters of a higher self or Audi? Perhaps more disturbing, how could we ever be certain that we are not complicit? The Bardo and the false light deception also figure into these concerns. How would we ever know? The series premise is an apt analogy for the human experience, especially when considered from a religious perspective with the soul being trapped in the physical body seeking transcendence. From the opening shot we see a birthing image, or is it a death image? The table is framed such that it could represent a womb or a coffin, a parenthetical trap, signifying the Innie's inescapable environment in which she will remain from the womb to the tomb. The first spoken words uttered in the series are, Who are you? These three words echoing the question each human asks upon being thrust into this world. The worksite's location being located deep underground signifies the fall, being born into and as the result of original sin. A subsequent installment will examine the show's use of symbolism, subliminal messaging, and the predictive programming employed within the narrative. When one learns to speak the language of his rulers, then no secrets can be kept and no clues escape his attention. Keep asking the right questions. The 1990 film Total Recall explores similar themes. The main character, Quaid, is a former intelligence agent who was deactivated and now lives a mundane life ignorant of his former activities. During a memory implant procedure, his former identity is uncovered or reactivated. In the film, recreational memory packages have become commonplace. They are a luxury consumer experience that allows its customers to implant memories in their minds of having visited exotic locations while living lifestyles and donning alternative identities without incurring the expense or danger that comes with them. Two scenes of interest are eerily parallel to the themes and questions raised by Severance and merit a mention in the current discussion of self, memory, and identity. Oh, don't take my word for it. Someone you trust wants to talk to you. Who is it this time? My mother? Howdy, Quaid. Now, if you're listening to this, that means that Quado is dead and you have led us to him. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't let me down. Sorry for that shit I've put you through, but hey, what are friends for? I would like to wish you happiness and long life, old buddy, but unfortunately, this is not gonna happen. You see, it's my body I've got there, and I want it back. Sorry to be an Indian giver, but I was here first. So, adios, amigo, and thanks for not getting yourself killed. <laughs> hey, maybe we meet now at dreams. A similar lack of humanity is displayed in Severance when Heli R is confronted by her Audi over the attempted disfigurement. A look of sheer horror and disbelief overcomes her expression as she witnesses the indifference of her Audi, the side of her that dwells in the mysterious world beyond her own, who assented to the process that condemned her to this unimaginably cruel fate. 
Of particular interest is the level of horror and distress expressed by the victims who are subjected to these insidious procedures. Quaid's discovery that he had assented to the procedure parallels Helly's predicament. We can see the sheer horror and disbelief in both characters at the realization that their suffering came at their own hands. This process of self-awakening and transformation is deeply symbolic. Come in, Mrs. Quaid. I love you. Right. That's why you tried to kill me. No. I'd never do anything to hurt you. Bullshit. What's bullshit, Mr. Quaid? That you're having a paranoid episode triggered by acute neurochemical trauma? Or that you're really an invincible secret agent from Mars who's the victim of an interplanetary conspiracy to make him think he's a lowly construction worker? Stop punishing yourself, Doc. You're a fine, upstanding man. You'd have a beautiful wife that loves you. But you've got to want to return to reality. Swallow this. What is it? It's a symbol of your desire to return to reality. All right. Let's say you're telling the truth, and this is all a dream. And it could pull this trigger, and it won't matter. It won't make the slightest difference to me, Doug. But the consequences to you would be devastating. In your mind, I'll be dead, and with no one to guide you out, you'll be stuck in permanent psychosis. The walls of reality will come crashing down. One minute, you'll be the savior of the rebel cause, and the next thing you know, you'll be Cohagen's bosom buddy. But in the end, back on Earth, you'll be lobotomized. So get a grip on yourself, Doug, and put down that gun. Swallow it. This is a perfect example of the form of deception designed to lure the awakening soul back into the system of deception. It is a part of the morphing labyrinth. The deceiver knows full well that he is lying and that his target's perception is accurate. Yet, he proceeds to manipulate Quaid into questioning his own faculties and perception of reality. This is a diabolical level of manipulation and psychological coercion. It elicits such shock, confusion, and doubt as to strain one's sanity to the point of breaking. The technologies presented in Severance and Total Recall are not fictional. The search for methods of mind control and the creation of programmed sleeper agents evolved out of the CIA's MK Ultra project, which began back in the 1950s. More on this later. The agency became interested in creating programmable assassins who could be activated remotely to carry out objectives and then be deactivated without having any memory of the act. An assassin of this nature creates plausible deniability for the agency. If the assassin was caught, no secrets or motives could be revealed to the enemy. This required the creation of an alternate identity within the subject's mind an identity whose memories were compartmentalized and isolated from those of the host. The severed process is a more literal interpretation of the process developed by the CIA. Rather than reliance on a psychological mechanism, a chip is implanted in the subject to dissociate the two identities and keep their memories compartmentalized. Successful applications of the methods and techniques the MK Ultra project designed to achieve complete and remote control of the mind of an individual eventually evolved into more subtle and diffuse methods of control to be applied more broadly upon the entire social group. This is the primary focus of this channel. We are what we remember. Identity is constructed based upon past experiences, on memories. Technology that alters this most profound sense of self will change who we are at our core. How can we ever truly know who we are? How can we possibly know if the memories we possess are authentic? Could we not awaken at any moment possessing the memories of someone who has never existed, programmed with a storehouse of memories created artificially and implanted into our minds? Would our former self not cease to exist? And what would become of the person who existed before these new memories? As the first scene open amid a black screen, the first words the viewer hears are, who are you? 
a deceptively simple question that many struggle to answer. From the outset, the show seeks to explore the true depth of this question. Specifically, what is a self, and how does memory and identity relate to whatever the self is? Who are you? Can you ever really know? Even those who believe they have an answer may find themselves uncertain, especially when confronted with knowledge that technology exists to alter, erase, or even reprogram one's identity. Perhaps a man is never born but manufactured, his memories implanted by some supernatural or technological means. Perhaps the identity and past life is programmed into his mind, and when he awakens into this new timeline, all memory immediately conforms to the new reality, leaving no possible way to recall who he once was. If such a technology as that depicted in Severance exists, it renders our identity suspect, for if our memories can be so easily fragmented and severed, we would never have any certainty as to who we are. Like Heli R, upon hearing the first words, Who are you? uttered into the blackness of Severance's opening scene, we too would be left disoriented and confused. We would be forced to rely on the testimony of others, those who had come before us. Sound familiar? The examples of technology depicted in these films are reflections of the same technology that exists in our reality. Evidence clearly proves that intelligence agencies have conducted research into these same areas of memory, identity, and mind control. Are we to believe their research was unsuccessful? How can we ever be certain that we have not been severed? Perhaps when we go to sleep at night and our consciousness slips away, our bodies are commandeered by some other consciousness that resides within us, that takes control as the we that we are. In this reality, lies dormant somewhere in the depths of the mind. Have you ever awakened feeling unrested with muscle aches and strange wounds to which you cannot ascribe a cause? Your entire neural system is being rewired. The neural network is being attuned to a series of dysgenic and maladaptive behaviors designed precisely to keep you disconnected, not only from others, but from your true sense of self. Followers of Dark City will come to truly understand the language of the Dark Ones. If we are to free ourselves from the programs that determine our fate, we must first learn the language of our programmers. You are gazing into a literal black mirror. As you stare into the blackness, into the interminable abyss, someone or something stares back into you. Time loses all meaning and all sense of self is dissolved. You are lost in its depths. The demons possess you through this portal. Like a labyrinth, the black mirror is a rabbit hole down which you are forever tumbling and from which you may never return, and your self-image will be remade into whatever form the dwellers within the darkness of the black mirror want you to be. And start asking the right fucking questions. <laughs>